sessions of uh, Across Buildings Through Time with Dr. Les Crocker. Tonight we're going to be talking about the downtown. So at the end of the lecture, we'll be having a small field trip to and meeting at Second Tent Pearl, so outside of Satori Arts. Uh, just as a, also a reminder, upcoming this fall, we have our uh, footsteps, start walking and bus tours. September 6th is the downtown, that's a walking tour. September 13th is the Main Street Meander. September 20th is the Franciscan neighborhood. The 27th is North Lacrosse. You can sign up for these. Uh, they're free of charge. You can sign up either by calling the archives department or you can register online at footstepsoflacrosse.org. And there are, so you can remember that. Uh, there's a few slips over here. Dr. Parker. Okay. So here we are in the, the seventh of the series. Uh, I really appreciate the time that you have taken to follow through on, on these. I know it's difficult uh, get home, get something to eat, get down here by 6 o'clock. Uh, I know it is a, uh, a hardship for some of you, and I appreciate the fact that you're willing to keep going on it. We're going to go completely different tonight although many of the same forces that acted on domestic architecture will act on commercial architecture, as you'll see very quickly. Uh, here is just a general shot uh, looking at the old riverfront area uh, of the town. Uh, you can see st steeple of the uh, Catholic Church there, uh, City Hall, or no, that's the courthouse over there and city hall and post office uh, towers over here. Next slide. Most of the riverfront area was not very enticing uh, through the second half of the 19th century. Barges unloading materials you see here. Uh, don't quite know what occasioned this photograph. Uh, the people all seem to be waiting, lined up looking off to the right here uh, as if something's going to happen over here or has happened. But uh, anyway, it gives us a, a, a real view uh, of what the uh, riverfront looked like. The old swing bridge that we'll talk about next time uh, here uh, in the uh, photograph. Next slide. Pretty much the same thing except looking the opposite direction down toward um, Riverside Park, which is just barely visible as a few saplings. Uh, so this photo probably dates around 1910, something like that. Um, and at that time, the riverfront had really been cleaned up a lot. Uh, because the railroad had come in and was taking an awful lot of, uh, you know, transportation. So the riverfront was not nearly as crowded as it had been uh, in the 1860s and 70s and even in the 1880s. Next slide. Uh, here, uh, a lithograph of one of the lumber yards in town. Uh, the logs floating in, hauled up into the saw shed, rough sawn, then moved to wherever uh, for later detailing, depending on the quality of the wood and the length of it and all of that. Uh, so these lumber companies were huge enterprises and of course required huge expenses to store uh, lumber. Uh, your logs are coming in in the spring. Uh, you go out into the woods in the winter, cut the trees, pile them on the ice or as close to the ice as you can get, uh, and then wait for the spring thaw to bring the logs down the Black River, uh, the Lacrosse River, uh, 
but particularly the Black River, uh, then herded into corrals uh, and then processed log by log uh, through these huge mills. And at various times, there were as many as 9, 10, 11 uh, of mills of roughly the same size, all up the Mississippi waterfront, uh, on the Black River waterfront, North La Crosse, uh, Copeland Park, of course, is the site of the Copeland Lumber Mill. Uh, so La Crosse was really dominated. The river front of La Crosse was dominated by the steamboat landings and the um, uh, lumber yards. Next slide. Okay, you recognize this um, as uh, third and uh, J, and you recognize the subway here. Next slide. Here we're looking down uh, J. What was this like 100 years ago? This corner, for reasons I don't really understand, preserved many old buildings much longer than anywhere else in town, uh, which is one reason why this whole area has been rehabbed, uh, because there were some pretty shoddy buildings on it for many years. Next slide. Here we're standing in the same spot looking down the street toward the river. Uh, this was the uh, Esperson Hotel. It was the Grand Hotel. Uh, it burned, uh, and the third floor was removed. Uh, but the ground floor and the second floor are still there today. Uh, very simple form. You wouldn't know they were uh, anything in particular uh, if it wasn't for old photographs like this. But over here on this corner where that subway is now, you see the remains of several one, two-story frame buildings. That was what La Crosse downtown looked like in the 1850s and into the 1860s. Gradually in the 1860s, we begin to get references to veneering, where these buildings got brick veneer fronts put on them. But originally, they would have all been framed. Next slide. Whoops. Same corner from a different uh, perspective. Uh, this is the corner in. Uh, we were just looking at it. The building next to it has been torn down and a newer, more modern building put into place. But you look at the corner in, you look at these uh, frame buildings down here. Again, that's what La Crosse looked like. This photograph uh, is uh, sometime around 1911 to 1915. Uh, the Harris Cafe that you can see down here uh, was only in existence from 1911 to 1915, which is the way I've dated this photograph. So this was part of downtown La Crosse uh, as late as 1915, actually even later. You see pretty ramshackle uh, construction this had to be built before 1857. Fire laws came into effect in 1857 that required all buildings after that date uh, to be of brick or stone. So that's one way we know the age of this building. It had to be before the fire laws went into effect. Uh, it was grandfathered in and stayed for years and years and years, far beyond what anybody would have ever imagined. Next slide. It's also kind of indicative of how uh, really run down Pearl and Jay, uh, King even, uh, were. Uh, many of them had been, um, or many of those streets uh, had at one time had boarding houses and uh, taverns and whatnot. Uh, dealing with the uh, sailors on the steamships that were going up and down the river. Once that traffic fell off, uh, then those uh, premises were no longer so much in demand and the area really declined. 
Mm -hmm. I always had that last photo. You know, the streets were paved with brick. When did they start doing that? Do you know? It varies. The town experimented with just about every surfacing material imaginable. Uh, that was a real problem in the 19th century. Uh, dust. Uh, and of course, that dust is uh, pounded horse manure. Uh, every horse is going to produce 30 pounds or so of manure every day. Uh, they're not going to do it necessarily in the stable. Uh, it's all over the streets. Uh, and in the summer, it dries and it's all over your house. And in the winter, it's a mud that comes into your house. Uh, so street paving was really an important issue. They tried planks. Uh, they tried, uh, but planks don't last any time at all. Uh, they tried ingrain wood, uh, wooden blocks, sort of like wooden cobblestones. Uh, they tried cobblestones in some places, bricks in some places, uh, several different kinds of uh, what we would call asphalt paving. Uh, sometimes simple as gravel with tar sprayed on it. Uh, anything to give a, a, a covering. Things were so bad that uh, Mr. Cargill and Mr. Macmillan had part of Cass Street, a block of Cass Street, paved with asphalt for themselves. They paid for it uh, to keep the dust down. <clears throat> So let me remind you of uh, the stud frame construction we were talking about that allowed uh, the housing boom in La Crosse uh, to occur. Simple dimension lumber, two by fours, two by sixes, nailed together. As opposed to the more laborious system, next slide, uh, of the timber frame construction uh, that I mentioned to you. So these stores downtown are being built out of the same two by fours and two by sixes and the same nails that all the houses are being built out of. Uh, so we're not going to have construction of this quality or solidity. Uh, they're very cheaply made and quickly erected. Next slide. Very typical uh, two story store, actually from about 1885, uh, but it's of a type that was in La Crosse as early as the uh, mid-1850s, 1855, it could just as easily be. Uh, a store of, of some sort, in this case a saloon, uh, down below, uh, a door on the side with a stairway going up with quarters for the owner. So you lived above your store. Gradually, as uh, the economy got better and better, many of these store owners moved out uh, away from the downtown, uh, and the second floors became rental uh, rooming houses in, in some instances. But most of them started as owner, uh, owned store, uh, and residence uh, above. If you look, see that? One over here, that's the gable roof peeking out. This is a false front, just like in the Western movies. They did them that way because it looks more impressive than having the gable end uh, of the uh, roof pointing toward the uh, street. But because of the narrow lot, they had to have a long building. That long building, you know, means a gable roof. Next slide. Here's a slightly different shot. You can see uh, the building here uh, and the gable roof behind it. This is sort of the tide line of the expansion of the downtown. It got Part way down Main, between 5th and 6th, sort of ran out of steam. Well, it ran out of economy. The, the lacrosse economy bottomed out uh, and didn't expand again for years and years and years. 
So every time you drive down Main Street, you're crossing over into that uh, business district that was basically frozen, uh, with a few exceptions sometime in the 1880s, 1890s. Next slide. This is what you see today, uh, the Briar Patch and this uh, store. I don't know what's in there now. There you see our gable roof still sticking up. Uh, the old uh, home uh, that uh, was here as a bar is still there now uh, serving uh, different uses. Uh, all of this row uh, was at one time one story uh, houses, businesses, quite often mixed use. Uh, so you'd have a bedroom behind, but you'd be selling goods uh, out of the uh, front room of the house. Next slide. The Red Ski uh, Cobbler Shop that some of you may be familiar with. It's now uh, down by the uh, Hickson House. Uh, here it is when it was still in the backyard uh, of the folks that owned it. Uh, and again, you can see that gable roof uh, with the false front uh, in front of it to give more prestige to what's just a simple little uh, building that's uh, only about 10 feet wide. Uh, but how big a building do you need for a cobbler shop? Uh, so the downtown was studded with these small little uh, businesses and shops uh, that if they didn't need lots of storage area and didn't need lots of work area, uh, they could indeed be uh, quite small. Next slide. Uh, here's one out on market uh, that uh, was a general store type building. Uh, but again, now it's two stories, but still with that same false front uh, being used here. But it's, uh, or at one time, was a quite innovative building because it has uh, cast iron pilasters uh, supporting this very large uh, display window area uh, for the uh, store. And we'll talk some more about cast iron in just a minute or two. Next slide. Some of you remember Bill Cycle Inn. Another of those very old buildings that predated the fire laws. Next slide. Whoops. It's the old Wisconsin Hotel. Frame, three stories, two story addition over on the side. Cover it with stucco and nobody ever noticed it again. Next slide. Here it is coming down. And you can see the uh, simple stud frame construction of the building. So my point is that uh, there are bits and pieces of old lacrosse that uh, are still around. Uh, if you look carefully, uh, spend a little more time in the alley. Uh, than you do out on Main Street, and you'll notice these kinds of things. Because the backside of the buildings don't ever change. Nobody ever renovates the backside of the building. Next slide. Uh, you're familiar with the Dance Light Studio <coughs> at the foot of the new bridge. Um, wasn't so interested in the building, although it is an interesting building with the corner entrance. There was a brief fad uh, of corner entrances in La Crosse, usually with a tower uh, above them uh, and a nice column of some sort, in this case a marble column, uh, giving visual support to that tower. Uh, what I want to show you is around here on the back side of the building. So show us the next slide. And here you see the frame structure. Uh, they were tearing off part of the old aluminum siding, and so I took this opportunity to, to take some shots because it's not always clear just in description what, what's happening, what's going on. You see nails, the heads of nails, and sort of rows. 
Uh, and those, of course, are corresponding to the studs that are underneath that sheathing. Those wooden boards are just a sheath, an outer skin. Uh, the horizontals, you see, are uh, thin wooden lath strips that have been nailed down over tar paper. The tar paper is almost all gone. Uh, next slide. You can see bits of it uh, in here, and there was some up on top. Uh, but you can see how that lath was just nailed to keep the tar paper in place. Uh, and then they built the brick veneer in front of it. The big nails that you see sticking out would be put in every so many courses high, driven in right at the top of a brick, and then the mortar laid in over the nail. So the nail is embedded in the mortar, and that's what links the brick veneer to the uh, frame of the house. Uh, you don't want your veneer falling off. Um, so that's the reason for those long nails. Next slide. OK, here's a little diagram to help us understand what we're looking at in these small uh, commercial buildings of the downtown. We have a lower section that's the storefront. Then above that, we have usually offices or sometimes apartments, uh, or as I indicated, the home of the, the building owner. Uh, so they're up above. Uh, the uh, storefront area will have its own visual system of support with columns or pilasters, at least on the corners, to support uh, a cornice. Uh, that horizontal form that separates the uh, ground floor from the upper floors. The building will also have a cornice. Uh, the cornice for the whole building will be in proportion to the entire building, where the cornice for the uh, storefront will be in proportion to just the height of the storefront. So we're dealing with proportions here. Um, it's pointing to a band of windows above the main windows. And I've got a better slide that shows it later. Many of you think of uh, an old hotel or even old houses would have transom windows uh, above a door. So you could open, it would be a tilt window. Uh, except these transom windows don't tilt, they're uh, permanent. So these are the parts of a, um, a standard small uh, business. I say small, we're talking probably 16 feet wide. The lots vary somewhat 12 to 20 feet uh, in that range, but most of them are about 16 feet wide in La Crosse uh, when you, you go poking in the records. One reason for that is uh, once you get beyond 16 feet, a single span of floor joist, uh, you, you got to op uh, up your strength considerably. Uh, whereas a two by eight can span a 16 foot space reasonably well, and you can put a second floor up there. Uh, but uh, if you're going to go very high, you got to have more support. Uh, next slide, let's look at some examples. Some of these, or actually this whole series, uh, were down on Main Street in the 100 block of Main between Front and Second. Now all gone because of the um, urban renewal project that wiped out uh, a block and a half depth uh, of La Crosse that took place in the 1970s, early 1970s. Many of the buildings in the downtown were like this simple three bay storefront. Uh, entrance in the center, display windows on each side. That's just a standard form. You see it over and over and over again. This is a little bit uh, after the um, 
the big change. The big change came when brick veneering allowed you to do this sort of thing, to have nice brick arches on the front of your building, which gave you more window space for display purposes. There will be a later revolution when cast iron becomes more common uh, and the window openings become even larger than what you see here. But this is sort of a, a typical, uh, say, 1868, 1870s forefront, storefront. After business has gotten so good that they can veneer their old two-story wooden store. But the side walls, the back wall, the roof are all the old building. It's just the front that's been veneered. Uh, and that's you know one of the marvelous sayings with stud frame construction. You can pull out this section and put in another one, pull out this section, put in another one. It's all a big tinker toy set that you nail together. If we move up the street one building in the next slide, you see a variation on that standard unit that I was talking about. Here we've got the three bays with the window, uh, door window, uh, but here we have that side entrance uh, leading to a stairway going up to uh, the second floor. Uh, so this is what the, uh, the Toller building uh, the bar that we were looking at earlier would have looked like after a veneer job. We've also added uh, cast iron window heads, uh, sheet metal cornice up above uh, that's quite elaborate. Uh, we also are beginning to get cast iron columns uh, being used. Uh, and that's part of the iron front survey that uh, I'll again mention in a minute. So we've got the basic three bay unit, then we've got the three bay unit with a side entrance, such as you see here. Next slide. Same thing, three bay unit, side entrance. Side entrance has been boarded up now. Uh, so you have to kind of watch and, and look carefully, but you can still uh, see how these types of buildings are used and reused over and over. And what I'm telling you doesn't apply just to La Crosse. Uh, that uh, any Midwestern city went through pretty much the same thing. Uh, as more uh, iron and steel became available, uh, the display windows got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, this is the old Metamorphosis uh, record shop. Mm -hmm. Julian was one of the pioneers on Pearl Street that began the whole process that has resulted in the Pearl Street that we know today. Uh, uh, that was to keep uh, folks from falling off. Is that what you were asking? Yeah. Uh, Metamorphosis was a record shop and head shop, uh, the first one in La Crosse. Uh, and I'll show you some slides in a minute, but the rest of Pearl Street was bars. Bar after bar after bar after bar. There's probably five of them along Pearl Street. Uh, and then there was Metamorphosis, uh, the head shop. Uh, so the potheads are meeting the uh, alcoholics uh, and Pearl Street on a Friday night was, was quite rambunctious sometimes. Uh, I was going to say something else, but I've forgotten. Next slide. Here's a double. So we've got two stores uh, with large display window. Uh, entrance, center entrance, taking you upstairs, uh, and then entrance to the other store. So we're taking our, our basic unit and now we're expanding it somewhat for variety. And of course, two of the really nice bay windows uh, uh, in La Crosse that, next slide, 
have unfortunately been covered up. Uh, but again, these are uh, both with the Mueller building and the building next to it. Uh, these are surface changes. Uh, this is basically stucco that's been put on the material underneath. So all of this is changeable. Uh, these buildings are not lost by any means. Uh, they may be significantly hidden, uh, but they're not lost. Next slide. Organizing large buildings visually is another real significant chore. Uh, here, the building's been divided into really five sections. Two end pavilions, you see here, and here, a central section, and then two sort of intermediate zones between the end pavilions uh, and the center pavilion. Of course, as you might expect, the center pavilion uh, is where the stairway would be carrying you upstairs to the upper floors. Uh, down below, two stores side by side, on each side of the central entrance. So now we've got four stores, uh, but still using that same uh, pattern uh, of uh, window, door, uh, whatnot, openings. You need to vary your surface. I've cautioned you over and over again about the plainness of the brick wall and how appalling that can be. Uh, by using these pavilions, where they are not much more than a brick, brick and a half extended from the wall. It's still, it's enough to break the surface of the wall. It's enough to provide a light and shadow patterns uh, that relieve the monotony of the building. By having strong units for the uh, windows, uh, the mullions of the windows and the dividers between the windows, uh, you manage to get some uh, vertical emphasis uh, rather than that uh, massive horizontal emphasis uh, that you tend to get with brick. Uh, they've also modified that by very clearly dividing floor levels. So the ground floor, uh, second floor, uh, and then the upper level cornice. Uh, very robust uh, handling of the brickwork. Uh, this is, is really um, way out there in terms of traditional brickwork in La Crosse. But unfortunately, uh, the upper part of it's been chopped off. Next slide. You go by it uh, quite often, and the ground floor has been uh, modified. But here again, the damage hasn't been completely done the building could be brought back with relatively little brickwork up on top. I mean, it was just decorative gables up there anyway, uh, and some rehab on the ground floor and get rid of that terrible paint job, uh, and you'd be back to a significant uh, building for the time. We're still dealing with small units, small stores, a grocery store, uh, well, maybe, but you're much more likely to go to the green grocer and to go to the meat market uh, and to go another place for your flour and salt and, and dry uh, ingredients. Uh, so, you know, you don't have what we would think of as a department store. That was the big change that the department store made. It brought all the little stores, all the little departments under one roof. Uh, but at this point in time, even when they're in one large building, we still have separate units, shoe stores, a hat store, a dress store, uh, a tavern, uh, all mixed up uh, down the street in the same building. Next slide. OK. 1857, at the New England House, which was a, a hotel on the corner of uh, Main and Front, which is where we are here, 
caught on fire. And the fire burned the whole block of Front Street from Maine to State and damaged a number of the buildings that were on the uh, west side of the street. This is the east side of uh, Front. But many of the buildings that were on the west side that fronted onto the river were also damaged by the fire. City Council went into emergency session and passed fire laws literally while the embers of the stores were still burning. These fire laws had been argued about for years uh, and nothing ever done. Well, when half the city burned down, they decided they better do something. Uh, so they passed fire laws. Anything uh, front, second, third, from state to cash uh, had to be fronted with brick. Fourth was added uh, a year later or two years later, and then up to fifth was added several years after that. Today, the fire laws, of course, have been completely changed, very different. But uh, those were the very early efforts in La Crosse to deal with, with fire. Uh, what in terms of it, it took the same thing uh, and then once you get the fire laws you get the volunteer fire departments and there are a bunch of yahoos that are out having fun half the time that yeah they're going to do their best to put the fire out but they're not professionals and hey we got to wait for Jim Bob because he can't get his pants on quick enough and it really was a clown show sometimes, and fights. They would fight each other uh, in some cases, of whether my uh, fire company got to put out the fire as opposed to your fire company putting out the fire. Um, it took a while before we got a professional fire company. Uh, but, you know, I, I think probably every city in the Midwest went through that same sort of nonsense. Uh, and the same, much the same with the police departments, uh, that uh, the police departments weren't filled with the most noble and uh, high quality uh, help that you could find at that time. But anyway, the block burned down. Within about six months, the Juno block, which is what we're looking at here, had been built. A brick building that was 25 bays long, three bays or three stories high. I've been showing you what everything else in La Crosse looked like. It was these one story wooden shanties. It was built by a group of investors. Uh, there were at least 12 uh, different men that were involved uh, in the building itself and groups within the big group so that one group had this section of the Juno block, first 10 bays of it. Then the next five bays were owned by two other men and then there was another 10 bays uh, of building uh, beyond that. Gigantic building. La Crosse in 1857 had I doubt if it had 5,000 people, 4,000 maybe. Uh, but this was just a gigantic structure and visible from each end of the river as you approached La Crosse. I mean, it was a major statement about the significance of La Crosse. Uh, yeah, we just burned down, uh, but look what we replaced it with. It Primarily is a, a brick building, a series of, of brick arches uh, that you see here on the main street side, also stretching down the front street side. The two ends of the buildings, the 10 bays here and the 10 bays down here, are the same in terms of their proportions and their detailing, their decoration. And I think everybody in the group sort of thought the middle five bays would also be like the rest of the building. There would be one continuous unit. 
But the owner of that middle section, a man named Winterman, who was from New York City, uh, owned the middle five bays, and he built something completely different. Next slide, please. Uh, here, the uh, Juno block, as it appeared about 1970, just before it was demolished. It was looking pretty rough. Uh, this corner, the corner of front and uh, main, was a hotel on the, the second and third floors. Almost continuously, uh, for 140 years, there was a hotel um, in this building, in that location, under many different names. Next slide. Let's get on down the building to see what we want. Okay, this is what we're looking for. These uh, five, um, six bays. No, five. I didn't bring my glasses tonight. I brought them, but they're out in the truck. Uh, five bays of the building, cast iron window heads as opposed to brick arches. But down here is what I'm most interested in. These are cast iron piers or pilasters that are supporting a cast iron lintel that you don't see because it's covered by the brickwork. This is the first evidence of cast iron being used architecturally in La Crosse. And I don't think we'll find anything earlier. It was not made in La Crosse. La Crosse did not have foundries capable of doing this kind of casting in 1857. Uh, so it was brought in uh, probably by steamboat. Uh, the rail line was coming into La Crosse, but I don't know whether uh, well, we'll just say it could have been brought in by rail or by steamboat. Uh, but these pilasters, there's one right here in the corner. There's one here, 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 here. Those six pilasters and the cast iron beam that they support, as well as the cast iron window heads, are the first cast iron in lacrosse. Why is cast iron important? Why am I making such a big deal over it? Uh, because cast iron is, of course, the first really usable form of iron that we have. We went on, God bless the Civil War, taught us all sorts of things, like how to make better cannons. And those better cannons were made out of better quality iron. And after the Civil War, we discovered that better quality iron could be used to hold up buildings. And of course, it metamorphosis then to steel. And I can't even begin to get into the point at which iron becomes steel. Uh, that's a, a metallurgical uh, process. There are many, many kinds of, of steel. Uh, so, you know, when we're using the term steel, we're really throwing around generalities. But I think you understand what I mean. Because it was with, only with steel that we had a material that could provide usable interior space in tall buildings. I don't know whether you probably have never gone to the Flatiron Building in Chicago, but it's one of the last brick wall skyscrapers. And they got the flat iron building up to about 15 stories. The only problem is there is no space on the ground floor for anything except the elevators. Because the ground floor has to be practically solid brick to support the 14 stories above it. And the second floor doesn't have much office space. And the third floor has a little bit more. But the fact is. Brick is heavy relative to the amount of weight it will support. We think of iron or steel as being heavy, but it's not heavy relative to what it can support. And that's the whole story. Cast iron becomes steel. Steel gives us skyscrapers along with the other two materials of the 20th century, large scale glass sheets and concrete. Concrete, glass, and steel, uh, those are the, you know, the th big three 
of the 20th century. Well, that all began in the 19th century. Look at this window opening. I mean, there's nothing there but glass. Yeah, we've got a, a pilaster here. But that pilaster is four inches wide. So we have an almost totally unencumbered display space uh, for our, uh, our goods, whatever they might be. That's a big selling point for the whole uh, iron and steel revolution. So all during the, 19, or the 1860s and the 70s, we see these wooden buildings getting brick veneers, sometimes with brick arches. Then others get cast iron supports in place of the brickwork and the frame construction. Sometimes buildings like this one that uh, originally had brick arches, they got changed to cast iron as well. So the whole uh, wooden front building tradition in La Crosse gets covered over with brick. And then here we've got this New Yorker who brings in cast iron for the first time. And he advertised his uh, building as the cast iron storefront or the cast iron store. Uh, supposedly, uh, it made buildings uh, you know, less susceptible to fire. Uh, but these kinds of buildings don't burn down from the ground floor. They burn down usually from the roof. Uh, from flying embers from somebody else's fire or from cooking fires. Uh, until we get tar paper, we don't have tarred roofs. We've got wooden shingles up there on these roofs. Uh, nothing like a 10-year-old shingle roof with a, a bunch of coals flying from your neighbor's chimney fire uh, to really uh, warm things up. But anyway, this is the beginning of cast iron. Next slide. Here's a, a prospectus that a man named Bogardus from New York, and that's why I'm so interested in this guy Winterman from New York who built the iron front store, because New York was a hotbed of cast iron experimental uh, construction. Uh, and here we see Bogardus store which was itself store and factory made of cast iron. So the whole building was constructed of cast iron, as opposed to here in La Crosse, where we just have cast iron piers or cast iron columns, a cast iron beam, uh, but we're still using an infill of brick or uh, stuccoed uh, uh, sheathing of some sort. Next slide. Here are those piers or uh, pilasters that I'm uh, talking to you about. Uh, relatively small rectangular units. Uh, you could get them four inches deep, six inches deep, eight inches deep. Uh, generally, they're about uh, three to four inches wide. Whatever height you wanted, whatever width you wanted, it all very quickly became standardized. Uh, and these were uh, purchasable in New York. Uh, they're available via these catalogs that are already beginning to be circulated uh, in the late uh, 1850s. Next slide. Window heads? What kind of window head do you want? Uh, take your pick. Uh, we'll send them out at whatever. Uh, again, they came in standard sizes that usually corresponded to what the millwork companies were beginning to standardize the size of their windows. Uh, so everybody across the country is standardizing, and I'm sure it's this sort of thing that contributes a great deal toward that standardization uh, nationwide and uh, window sizes or door sizes. Next slide, please. Some other a little more fancy window heads. Uh, these are just bolted to the brick surface. Drill a hole in the mortar joints and bolt these babes in place. 
Uh, they can be built into the brickwork itself, but uh, if that's too much trouble, you can just bolt it on. Next slide. Here's an iron house. All the walls are iron. Everything. Not many of these ever existed. I'm not sure if any were ever built, although uh, there are some examples such as this that uh, appear in catalogs and they're credited to Mr. So-and-so in Troy, New York or some such. Uh, but I've never found anything in the professional literature um, actually showing these uh, cast iron houses. Next slide. Have any heating problems, heating and cooling problems oh, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Heating, especially in the South, I imagine would be quite interesting. And up here, you dared not lick your wall. Uh, <laughs> Uh, decorative details, urns, brackets, finials, uh, they're all in the catalog. Next slide. Even rosettes. I'll talk about rosettes uh, a little bit more. When you got your beam running across your storefront, supported by your pilasters, your beam needs to be attached to the rest of the building, to the framework of the building. So there are usually holes in the I-beam uh, with uh, big screws that would be screwed into the uh, first floor joist across the building. Well, you don't want just an old bolt head sticking out of the front of your building, uh, so you buy a rosette. And these rosettes are made to go over the bolt heads uh, on your uh, cast iron beam. Next slide. Fences, grill work, yeah, we got that too for you. Uh, and of course, this is only possible because the railroad is going just about everywhere, steamboats are going just about everywhere. Uh, the whole explosion of transportation means the explosion of the American economy. Next slide. One of the simplest examples of a, a cast iron front building, an old butcher shop. Uh, this right portion, I think, was a butcher shop. I'm not sure what the left-hand portion was. Uh, but uh, here you can clearly see these uh, cast iron pilasters. Ignore all this busy stuff in between. That's just infill, plywood. Uh, Barry, zoom in on this right-hand doorway area. Yeah, you can see those cast iron pilasters right there. It's all you need, one here, one here, one here. Uh, the cast iron plate would be up here, although in this building they used uh, long, thin pieces of stone uh, for a, a lentil. Uh, more often, they simply use cast iron and hide it with brick. Another one of those double bill, uh, you know, double store buildings, uh, two stores, one on each side of the entrance uh, going up uh, into uh, the apartments above. This is over by the Terbo, uh, and is one of the only really untouched, uh, relatively speaking, um, buildings of this age uh, in town. Les? Yeah. I think Julian owned that one also. Okay. That's probably why it's in such good shape. Yep. I think that vision, putting the first and second story, so simple and handsome. Yeah. It's, it's a fine building. I mean, the uh, stone heads on the second floor uh, aren't normally this, this good. Uh, on a, a little, you know, two-unit store. Uh, I mean, it would have been a neighborhood store, uh, but somebody was obviously quite proud of it, um, and it's still in excellent shape. Original doorway, double uh, doors, usually in uh, this era, just as you see uh, on both the entrances. This area down here is what's called the bulkhead. 
Uh, you may have seen that term on the uh, uh, slide we were looking at. These would be where uh, the uh, windows would normally be. Uh, I've lost the word. You ask me about them. The what? Yeah, transom. That's it. Next slide. I've got better transom windows somewhere. Uh, just to show you what ironwork developed, this is uh, Brick Pomeroy's uh, Democrat building uh, and uh, the opera house, Pomeroy's opera house next to it. Uh, see if we can zero in on this ground floor. These are quite tall, thin, elegant uh, cast iron columns. You could never do that with wood. You couldn't do that with brick. Uh, cast iron uh, is really the only medium that, or steel, uh, that would allow you to do that. Unfortunately, very few designers understood cast iron, uh, so it, it, it was usually pretty clunky in the way it was used. But this building was designed by my man, uh, William Nichols, uh, and uh, he did a very fine quality job on this uh, front. The problem is that it's a sloping uh, stretch of the street, the main street, as it goes downhill toward the river. Uh, and so his ground floor came up quite high, or really we think of it as the basement, uh, came up quite high. Uh, and then the first floor is high above that. Uh, so that required these elongated arches. That burned in a big fire in the 1890s. Next slide. Okay, one other place uh, I want to bring to your attention uh, before we get on to the chronological development. I'm running a little over my time here. <coughs> Go over to the board store. Go visit Miles. Very nice man uh, who's doing wonders with a clump of very significant buildings in La Crosse's history. This is the only group, in fact, it's the only buildings that I know of that are constructed out of Granddad's Bluff limestone that still exist in La Crosse. Uh, and there are four of them, and then this one is actually uh, limestone, but has uh, had a brick veneer put over it. Uh, and he's hoping that at some point uh, that one can get cleaned up. But he's cleaning up each building, uh, trying to bring back the original front so far as he's able, uh, and he's uncovering a series of cast iron columns. Uh, at least two different kinds that we've documented so far. Uh, the earliest one done by the Torrance Iron Foundry, which was a local iron foundry. And that's what I have been hoping for and looking for for years, that uh, when did the lacrosse cast iron industry begin to compete with these out-of-city companies, such as shipped in the iron for the iron front store. Uh, so it's well worth the trip to uh, look at the cast iron work on uh, these buildings. I've got a little better detail coming up next, I think. Yeah, it's not terribly better detail, but you can see them uh, cast iron uh, here. Always known as a board store. What was the building for in the first place? They were a whole series of uh, stores. Uh, barber shops, furniture stores, it was a paint company um, into the 60s and 70s. They were really very cheap rentals. Uh, some artists had studios there. Uh, the kind of things that happen to buildings as they get old and, you know, they're off the main drag. Uh, so it was just a, a hodgepodge before uh, the board store started buying them up one at a time, basically. 
he started out with just the one building. I don't remember which, it may have been this one. This store also, uh, beside the nice front, still has the original tin ceiling inside, which is worth going to visit just to see the tin ceiling. And he's very friendly to people that just want to come gawk at his building because he's, he is proud of what he's doing there, as he should be. So on two accounts, the uh, excellent cast iron work uh, on his building, uh, as well as the fact that he's got the only Granddad Bluff limestone left in town. Next slide. Whoop, there's one of those great cast iron columns lying on its side. Most of them are uh, a Corinthian with capital with uh, heavy leaves around the top. Some are composite. The composite has the Corinthian leaves and the curved volutes of the ionic water. So they're a combination, ionic and Corinthian, and we call them composite. Uh, the Greeks used the Doric, Ionic, and very occasionally the Corinthian. Uh, the Romans had their own form of Doric, and they used the Ionic, and they used the Corinthian, and they used the composite uh, as well. So the Greeks and the Romans shared some uh, other areas they differed. But a, a look up online will give you all the information you want on classical columns. Next slide. Okay, that was all preface. Um, now we get to the story. Here on Pearl Street, uh, where today TJ's store is, that's the oldest group of buildings remaining in La Crosse that we can date. These three buildings right in here. Uh, this is probably 1975 or something, does it say? No. Uh, but about 1975, this would have dated as, and you can uh, see TJ was the first to move in after metamorphosis. Uh, he bought out a bar and uh, moved his clothing, knickknacks, uh, various kinds of things that he sells. Next slide. Of course, this is what they look like today. You know, this is one of our major victories in the battle for uh, preservation. Each of the stores has iron pilasters. So that tells me that originally these were frame buildings that were veneered, cast iron used uh, for their ground floor support uh, to provide lots of open window area. This upper space, this is a window transom in here, all the way across there. Most of them originally were uh, a fluted or pearled glass uh, that blocked sunlight. It would, it would let light in, but not direct sunlight. So you could uh, curtain your bottom windows, your display windows, when the sun got over in the west and was shining in your window. Uh, because sunlight, of course, is bad for fabric and paints and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so you could protect your store display, but still have windows up in the transom windows to let some light come into the store. That's also the strip where so many stores downtown now have their names. And it becomes sort of a name tag area uh, across the building. Three separate buildings originally. They probably were veneered all at the same time. Uh, the window heads are all the same. Uh, the pilasters, uh, although painted different colors now, uh, I think all three are the same. Uh, we'll have to look when we're down there tonight. Uh, this is where we're uh, headed uh, later this evening. Again, that typical store, two display windows, center entrance. Uh, the uh, 
type with a door to the side to lead you upstairs uh, didn't occur in all of these stores. Sometimes there would be a stairway in the alley, sometimes a stairway back in the back uh, of the building. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, wow. What happened to the graded carving on the second picture? It stops intermediate? That's TJ being crazy. Oh. <laughs> uh, that needs to go as well as the shingling uh, in the cornice. Uh, sometimes his exuberance gets more than uh, respectable. Uh, you're pointing out one of the eternal problems. Uh, I mean, if we're going to restore these accurately, we should tear this brick off and take it back to the frame. So you have to make a decision. Uh, at what point do you determine this is the building I'm going to represent? Uh, and this is... Uh, I think in some ways the best solution because this is the, the earliest that we can accurately document uh, is about 1862. So this would be the uh, fire codes and all that. Right. That's what this is after the fire code. Yep. We've got our brick veneer now. Next slide. Uh, also from the uh, mid to late 70s, uh, this is uh, the uh, Schwartz Hotel is actually several different hotels over the years. Uh, one of the grand buildings on Pearl Street that probably should have gone down, all things being equal, but uh, it somehow, it was between metamorphosis where Julian was trying to hang on and T.J. Petersley over here trying to hang on uh, and the bars in between. And the rest of the building was just an abomination. It started out as a two-story building over here. Look at that building for a minute, because it's not right. Look at the window spacing. And we have window, 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 double window, double window, single window, double double. Now that doesn't make sense. Our uh, gable is over the center of the building uh, where we have these paired uh, windows with fancy heads. But the center of the building falls part way into one of the stores below. And the stairway to go up into the building is over here, off center. Well, what happened is we had a three-bay building over here, these three bays, that was two stories high. And then they raised a story up here and built the rest of the building next to it. They left the existing uh, spacing of the windows because it really would have been a hassle to uh, change that. Uh, so we still see the old remnant of the original uh, two-story building uh, that was later engulfed uh, by the much enlarged Schwartz building. Again, those little, little details that tell you something different going on here. Something happened here. Next slide. Here's a, uh, an old image showing you the building uh, in its... Uh, Heyday, wonderful sheet metal cornice up here. Tin, some people would call it, uh, but most of them were galvanized sheet metal as opposed to, to tin, which is a little thinner and, and not as um, enduring as sheet metal is. Next slide. 
here you can see that sheet metal cornice. Well, I've got a better slide later. Anyway, this shows you uh, the building's been rehabbed now. Uh, it's really looking fine. Uh, excellent uh, restoration that's been done there on that entire uh, half block. Next slide. Okay, here's, this is an older view of that same cornice I was just showing you, and you can see how it's just a, a thin sheet of metal that's been bent and formed into the shapes uh, and applied to the brick surface. They look so substantial, uh, but they're really quite thin, uh, and that's why so many of them have disappeared. Uh, they rust out if you don't take care of them, and uh, store owners tear them off. Next slide. We're still um, in the 1860s. We're on Main Street now, um, just up from um, Powell Place, uh, the long brick building there on Main uh, between 2nd and the alley. So Powell Place is off over here. We're not going to look at it. Uh, this was the Fifner block. And Mr. Fifner built a three-bay store that you see here. Business got good. He added a stairway and another three bays of building. Business continued to get good. Uh, he added another uh, stairway uh, and another three units to his building. So this whole building uh, became the Fifner block. Uh, here you can see uh, that window treatment uh, that protects the uh, interior from direct sunlight. You also can see these funny brown brick uh, piers. Uh, they date from the 20s. That, that brown glazed brick was very popular in the 1920s and shows us that uh, somebody was trying to do some modernization or something of, of uh, this building. Next slide. Then in the 80s, it got uh, covered with scaffolding, and they're putting up wire mesh. Next slide. And this is the way it looks, or actually this is the way it looked when it was first done. Next slide. This is the way it looks today. Uh, it's even lost what little detailing they made after they uh, stuccoed it. Uh, so three very early significant buildings in La Crosse's history uh, hiding here under the stucco. Don't they redo the interior as well? Almost invariably the interiors are redone. And the only thing probably that will remain of an interior is a column oftentimes because they're cast iron columns and they're holding up you know, the floors above so you don't mess with them. Um, but we have only a few photos of uh, building interiors uh, from the 1880s, 1890s even. They're very uncommon. Oh, I better do something about my malware. Next slide. Well, I hear some folks remember the Mons Anderson building. For my money, the best commercial building in town. Uh, I mean, if we still had this thing, uh, the, what could be done you know, with it just goes on and on and on in terms of reuse. Second Empire style roof, certainly. Um, the mansard roof that we've been talking about in houses. It's also very Second Empire in this layering of decoration uh, on the uh, front of the building. Uh, the building was designed by William Nichols, La Crosse's greatest architect. Uh, it started out as a small two-story building over here uh, that uh, Mons Anderson enlarged to three stories. Uh, then business became much, much better. 
uh, and he added on uh, the whole units over here, tied the whole thing together with new stonework, uh, and organized his parts together uh, to a, a single building. Cast iron columns. The columns on this section are different from the columns on these two sections. This section got cast iron before these sections did. And when it came time to put the cast iron in over here, nobody made the earlier style. Or that's what I'm assuming. Or maybe Mons Anderson wanted something fancier than the old ones he had. Uh, because these are more elaborate. But I think what happened was that the older, simpler columns simply were not being made anymore. Uh, that design had been dropped from the catalog, uh, and uh, the more elaborate ones were preferred. Corner entrance, which was quite fashionable after the uh, Civil War. The side of the building on uh, second is designed as the building is on front, or on, on, on Main, the Main Street facade here. Uh, look with me for a minute. Here on the front, we have uh, three windows, then we have a group of windows, and then we have another three. This group section in the center, much more heavily decorated uh, than the flanking units. So these flanking units are treated as sort of simple uh, pavilions, uh, and the grand area uh, is in the center. Now we move over to the side, and we have the same three units as part of a pavilion, and then we have five units, just as we have in the middle of the front, and then we have three units uh, as the pavilion on the rear. Uh, so the two sides of the building are essentially the same, it's just an issue of decoration and window openings. Uh, and that's part of what makes the building uh, more delightful, coherent, uh, and visually delightful, is because the two sides of it work together. Uh, it's on a corner. If you don't design it to be seen as a corner building, then it's not going to work visually very well. It was uh, here, actually just outside the entrance to the building, that the big uh, stone lions that Mons Anderson had were located. There's one here in the Historical Society, or over on uh, King and uh, West Avenue, the Historical Society has a stone lion there. I but assume that... What was the exterior material? Was that stone? It's stone, yeah. It it's not Granddad's Bluff. Uh, I think it's Winona, because the Winona quarries were doing quite well at that time. Uh, the problem is that I spent a Sunday uh, downtown shooting some of these buildings, but I didn't expect to stay in La Crosse. I was shooting them because they were kind of interesting, uh, and I'd add them to my classes some way, sometime. Uh, now, you know, if I, I would love to go back and spend several hours shooting details of the columns uh, and the stonework and so on and so forth, but uh, so what's, there now? Uh, what's there now, main and second? That, yeah, that would be... Yeah. Nothing of interest, obviously. Uh, I mean, if nobody can come up with anything, then... When, when was this demolished? Uh, this was demolished about 1970. Oh, okay. 70, 71, I don't remember exactly. It was that, when I got out of the yeah. Army, March 23rd, 1970, and I came... A friend of mine picked me up and we rode our bikes down and said, you got to see something. And that corner we're looking at right there, if you could imagine a large monster biting off that mm -hmm. corner 
and the rest of the building was there, and that's what I saw. And it was, it was, it was, it was devastating. And did he manufacture things in that building? Was that was he a uh, manufacturer? Uh, uh, clothing. Clothing. Yeah, uh, clothing, towels, tablecloths, okay. uh, soft goods. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Well, that's. I didn't see a demolition of it. Uh, it was one of those things that it's, it's like funerals. Yeah. I stay away from them. Uh, I'm not going to get any value out of watching it being torn down, and um, I'd rather remember it like this than in pieces. Next slide. Uh, here was a stairway, very bad photo of the stairway, very nice wooden stairway going up to the second floor. Uh, the ground floor and second floor were shop or you know sales. And then the third, fourth, and attic uh, were manufacturing uh, for uh, everything that he made. Next slide. Truly a modern building. I mean, if you look at this interior, you know, ignore all this machinery and uh, the pipes and whatnot. Uh, we have cast iron columns supporting cast iron beams, no necessity for internal brick walls, uh, no need for frame walls. Uh, it is the um, steel that's carrying the weight of the building. It's the steel columns, the steel beams, uh, the framework, the outer skin is just that. It's an outer skin now. This is an early indication of the skyscraper idea. The glass wall uh, in which the internal part of the building is carried on internal columns and beams. Uh, <clears throat> he's not using a glass wall, but his exterior wall is not necessary for the support of this building. Uh, so he could have made his exterior walls out of plywood or tissue paper. It wouldn't have mattered. Uh, but of course, Mons Anderson is traditional. Uh, the interior of his building may be very radical because uh, Mons Anderson understands, I think, that this kind of open plan means he can put up partitions wherever he wants to put up partitions. He can put up areas of display uh, and move everything around unimpeded by walls. So that's the great uh, benefit of the internal skeleton construction uh, that we see uh, here. Uh, and I'm just, every time I see this slide, I'm floored uh, because this sort of thing wasn't supposed to happen uh, until the 1880s, really. But already in the 1860s, some people are starting to look forward to that, that time. Next slide. Up on the upper floors, our uh, steel columns are much simpler. You know, it's more expensive to cast a foliated column capital. Uh, so we'll use those on the ground floor. And on the upper floor, uh, we'll use these simple ones. What my time is. Next slide. Remember Rowley's office equipment? Sometime in the 1950s, aluminum siding salesman, like no other aluminum siding salesman, hit lacrosse. And underneath here, was a brick building from the early 1870s. You can even see it when the sun was right, uh, because you know this is uh, there are gaps, there are louvers in here, uh, and so you could see the ghost of this old building uh, back there. Uh, it is a very important building. Again, it's a building by William Nichols, uh, one of his early skyscrapers for lacrosse. Next slide, please. It's been rehabbed, brought back to its pretty close to original, although ground floor is, is not. But the ground floors on these buildings were changed in the 1870s, and they were changed in the 1880s and 90s, and just about every decade 
uh, there's some changing going on on the ground floors of, of some of these buildings. So we can't, we can't hope for miracles. Uh, but just to have uh, the original building uh, as it is in this uh, condition, it's in the process of being cleaned. It needs to be uh, cleaned. There's all sorts of um, exfoliates on the surface that uh, as bricks breathe, they will quite often uh, leave a white residue on the surface. Uh, and that's part of what needs being to, to be cleaned here. Um, this was one of the earliest three-story buildings after the big brick monstrosity that was the Juno block. Uh, as you might guess, the Juno block sort of shut down construction elsewhere in town. Uh, you don't build unless there's a need for building. And the Juno block would have satisfied an awful lot of stores uh, on the second floor. There were offices for lawyers, for real estate people, a whole raft of people. But by the early 1870s, the town was booming to the point to, uh, where Theodore Rodolph uh, built the three bays that you see uh, here on the corner. Uh, whenever possible, you start on the corner. Uh, that's the, the best location. Uh, he added three more bays. Things continued to prosper. He added three more bays over here. Uh, so this is the final version uh, of Rodolph's building. Originally with cast iron pilasters on the bottom. It's very characteristic of, of Nichols' large buildings in that he uses a well-defined ground floor this heavy cornice. Let's flip one more slide. Let's look at the side. Yeah, here it shows better on this side. Uh, uses this well-defined heavy uh, brick cornice to separate the ground floor uh, from the upper floors. Once you get below, once you get above two stories, organizing buildings vertically as well as uh, widthwise becomes you know, a real headache for architects, designers. Uh, Nichols uses uh, a system where he creates a platform with the ground floor as a platform for what's going to happen above. What sits on that platform are these two-story pilasters. You see four of them. So this is making a kind of end pavilion at each end and then a three-unit middle. Well, Nichols liked that system of organization, too. Same thing he used on the Mons Anderson building, uh, end pavilions uh, and then a uh, central section. Here, he doesn't emphasize the center of the center uh, because this was uh, all one building uh, and wasn't divided. Uh, so he doesn't uh, have a, uh, an entrance over here that uh, you know, visually goes up. Um, Nichols is working prior to sheet metal cornices b b being available. So all of his buildings originally had brick cornices uh, and some very fine brickwork uh, they had indeed. Uh, in many cases they've been covered over. Next slide. Just down the street, uh, on the corner of 3rd and Main, the old, uh, some people called it the post office building. Uh, it wasn't the old post office, which was the federal building and was uh, down across from Montgomery Ward. Uh, this is at 3rd and Main, and it did at one time house the post office in La Crosse, and that's where the name comes from. Uh, a couple of the Macmillans, uh, built this. But it also is uh, designed by William Nichols. Uh, you can see the idea of the ground floor uh, massive support uh, for the upper section, uh, dividing the upper part of the building into units by the use of these two-story pilasters 
uh, and then having a very large, uh, heavy, massive looking uh, cornice uh, at the top. A cornice that relates to the whole building, whereas the cornice uh, here on the ground floor is proportioned to the ground floor. Next slide. In the 1880s, a man named Carroll, who was only in town briefly, came into town, and this was the old uh, building we were just looking at, these six bays here. He added six bays further up on Main Street and then a uh, entrance unit here. Uh, so this is the original building, uh, this is the addition. Then ironically, the original building failed. Next slide, please. Uh, here you see it in its entirety, uh, the six bays of the original building and the seven bays that Carroll added. Uh, to his credit, he used exactly the same window heads uh, as appeared on the earlier building, uh, used the same brickwork, same decorative detail, uh, so for once, uh, we have an architect who adds on to a building who doesn't shout, this is my part, and make it different from the other part. Uh, he's acknowledged the, um, the quality of Nichols' work and has duplicated it. Uh, but this shows the building when it was walled off. Let's go around and look at this side on the next slide. They put in an elevator to a dance um, nightclub up on the third floor. And when they did that, they did something that interfered with the footprint of the building. Uh, you see this crack. You see the way this wall is kind of wavy. Brick walls aren't supposed to be wavy. Uh, that's not a good idea. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, ooh, uh, up and down the mortar joints go. So the result was the original building was torn down, and the part that remains is the addition that was put on by Mr. Carroll. Next slide. Here you see it coming down. 1981. Yep. Yeah. Next slide. So this is Carroll's addition uh, to the original building. We're getting pretty close to time out. Uh, I'm not anywhere near done with commercial, and that doesn't bother me at all uh, because the public architecture section that we're going to talk about next week, I'm going to steal some of that to finish our commercial talk uh, because the, commer uh, the, the public is a lot less interesting, uh, I think, than what we've still got remaining. And besides, I wrote a book on it, and you can look at the book and see the commercial all you want to. Uh, the library has copies of it. You don't even have to buy it. So let's uh, break. We're going to meet down at Second and Pearl at uh, TJ's, uh, Sotario Art, Arts, uh, Buzzard Billy, that area. And then next Monday, uh, we'll, or next Tuesday, we'll finish off with the commercial and a quick look at public. Best iron bit in town, photograph it, and see what we find, because we don't know what, you know, we don't really know what we're looking for at this point, except compiling data that's related. Uh, I've already suggested that Mons Anderson changed columns on his building because the old ones had gone out of style and were no longer available. Uh, same thing might show up on these. We're also finding things such as how the Torrance name is put on changes over time. Uh, the earliest one I've got, it was actually a separate plaque that was riveted to the cast iron. 
And that makes me wonder, okay, did he buy the cast iron from Milwaukee or Chicago and then put his name on it? There's no question. I mean, he didn't buy this in Chicago. I mean, his name is cast into the bottom of that. Uh, so we've got at least three different versions of the Torrance Foundry or Torrance and Son Foundry or whatever. So, you know, as we get this material together and we combine it with, okay, we know this building was built in such and such a date, and we found a newspaper article that says the front was remodeled in 1873, okay, we say this pilaster is from 1873, which probably means that the pilaster like it around the corner is also from 1873. So we start to get these interrelationships, one supporting another, one uh, buttressing uh, the idea, making the idea even more complex. So that's part of, the, of what we want to do with the Iron Front project. And basically we're looking for people that can spend a couple of hours walking down the street, photographing the building, and then details of the ironwork. Then we can sit down, digitize them. You think I need, okay. So we can digitize them, digitize them, organize them, uh, and I don't know what we'll find. I mean, in that, since it's kind of pure research, uh, we're gathering material uh, when we don't know where the material will lead us. I do know that it's important to have the material uh, for a couple of reasons, and I think it'll be uh, an open file in the archives in the sense that as long as we get new photographs, we're going to be seeing new examples. Uh, as buildings are torn down, the ironwork's going to disappear, except we've got it recorded in the archives. As some buildings are rehabilitated and their ironwork is exposed, then we'll add them to the file. So this will be an ongoing kind of file uh, in the uh, archives. What the use of it is, I don't know, except uh, architects and engineers and those kinds of folks go absolutely nuts when you mention cast iron uh, on early buildings. And it is, it's the beginning of skyscrapers right here. But what fascinates me most is that it's absolutely irrelevant to the building here in La Crosse. These are frame buildings. They don't need a cast iron front. They don't need a brick front. Uh, they would be perfectly all right with, uh, you know, you could put an eight inch wooden beam across the front here and make as big a window as you wanted to. I mean, Lord knows we had plenty of eight inch beams in La Crosse at that time much cheaper than the cast iron would have been for them to bring in. So I have to come to the conclusion that the whole cast iron mania that we see in the 1860s and 70s uh, was driven by fashion rather than function. I mean, we think of cast iron as being functional and it uh, certainly developed that way, but it was also fashionable for a time. Uh, much the same way that uh, you know everything is nano these days. Uh, the nanotech. How, the, how early did they make the automobiles? Uh, I mean, it comes in gradually, so the frame is steel and the uh, carriage part is wood for a number of years. I don't know at what point that uh, we went to an all steel body. But anyway, the cast iron I think here in La Crosse is a, a kind of vanity thing. It's also business leaders saying, hey, we're progressive. Uh, we're up to date with cast iron fronts. Even if our cast iron front is you know, only holding up a handful of bricks. A couple of places they went to two stories. Uh, the um, Life Old Music building has a cast iron uh, pilasters like these on the second floor 
and it also has exposed uh, uh, I-beam. Uh, one of these stores, we've got an exposed I-beam, I'll show you. Right there. Oh yeah, right there. <laughs> Okay, an I-beam, a bottom plate, and a top plate, and a vertical in between, like the capital I. Uh, and that provides plenty of support, more than enough support for this building. And where the bolt heads are, you see the rosettes. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Now, what is this it's right here? That's part of the decorative uh, motif. I don't know that it's any particular design. Here, or is it bolted in? Or is that? Well, I it? see you're right. There's three of them at least. Yeah. I don't know whether they're original. Uh, some of these do actually have like a shield or something uh, here. Okay, that's why we need comparison. Yeah. Uh, we need to see what others that have this shape, what do they have? And that would tell us whether this is something that's been done to it later. Why don't we go on up the block a building or two and see what's up there? We can walk along the river. These are the most decorative of the cast iron pilasters that I know of in town. There may be others that are equally decorative, but these are really fancy uh, with a pointed Gothic arch uh, down below, uh, nice shield motif here in the, the center, uh, elaborate um, console uh, uh, up at the top, uh, all in decorative cast iron. You know, just this little extra. Uh, this is top of the line. You could buy much cheaper versions or pilasters that would do the same job, but uh, here they obviously wanted the very best. This is the bulkhead area that sometimes referred to. It's nothing except fill, filling in that hole. Or, or you, you could have brought your windows all the way down to the ground, but that was pretty dangerous uh, in early lacrosse with, you know, kids and bicycles and all that. So you've got a bulkhead and the windows extend up from that. Also, many um, businesses in lacrosse originally had um, space that went down to the basement of the building that was entered from the sidewalk. So where I'm standing would be an open space uh, with windows in the uh, basement for a barber shop or whatever, and there would be a railing around uh, here uh, and stairs going down uh, to keep people from being injured. Those are all gone now. The city uh, banned those. If you want to go much fancier than pilasters, you go with columns cast iron columns. Um, you don't use a full freestanding column usually. You'll use a half column or a three-quarter column uh, to provide a, an end joint for where your front windows meet your side windows. And so we need uh, information about those. When do they appear? What do we know in terms of manufacture of them? Okay, uh, yeah, all three of these stores all have the same, same kind of pilasters uh, put in at the same time, undoubtedly. In fact, most of the block was probably veneered at the same time, uh, if you You should be able to see 
a very specific line where the edge of the Swartz building stops and the two-story building begins. But it's not there. The bricks are interlaced, uh, which says that they had to be done at the same time. Are the window heads over here cast iron or not? Uh, those are simple enough to where they could be stone, uh, but they could also be cast iron, and there's no way to tell the difference without putting a magnet on it or being able to touch them. They're very, very simple, which suggests to me they may be stone. Because this was an era, and if you could get more, we'll take more. So even the window heads over here, uh, you know, have nice extras. Also, all the, the brickwork is almost pretty much uninterrupted, the whole length with the, uh, the molded brick, the curved surface brick, both the concave and the convex. So that's a short introduction to the early history of lacrosse uh, commercial. This is where it really didn't begin, but this is the oldest that we have remaining, uh, these three buildings. Uh, the others added on to, enlarged over time, and of course, several of those on Main uh, are uh, also very old, but completely engulfed. Powell, uh, Powell Place on Main and Second, that's at least six buildings, probably seven originally, uh, and they were all brick fronted together at the same time to make a more massive structure. Questions on anything I can help? Okay, we would like uh, to solicit your help as part of the Iron Front project. If you've got a couple of hours you can spend, it's not something that we have to do all as a group. Uh, or it is something that we could do as a group if people would like to. Sundays are probably the best time uh, to cruise this area uh, because nobody's around usually. So you can, you know, it's easy to take photos in the downtown if you don't have to worry about uh, traffic or uh, pedestrians. But basically somebody that can uh, take some basic pictures, we want general pictures of the whole building, then detailed shots of the ironwork. And from there we can tell whether we need to go back and get some better quality expert shots or whether we've, what we've got is enough. Uh, put it all together into the archives. So if you think you could uh, spare a couple hours at some point or would be interested in doing it on your own, uh, we can, you know, assign you a street uh, to work on. And it's basically uh, third and fourth. A few on second that remain, but almost nothing on second. But third and fourth is primarily where they are. So say something to me or Anita, and otherwise uh, I'll see you next week and we'll finish up the series.